Welcome to Mathematics. Today we'll be solving the Pearson and Excel IL January 2023 paper of Physics Unit 3. So in the first question we are given this setup where a student used a graphite pencil to shade an area of the graph paper where the thickness was uniform and we placed two and she placed two electrodes on both ends of this uh, shading and kept it in contact with it and measured the resistance. We have to state the resolution of the ohmmeter at first. The resolution will be the lowest, the highest decimal place it can measure. So this value, so the value farthest to the right. So here it can measure three up to three decimal places. So it can read up to three decimal places over here. 0.001 mega ohms now we have to find the percentage uncertainty in this uh, measurement the percentage uncertainty is equal to the the formula states uh, that the percentage uncertainty is the precision divided by 2 divided by the measured value into 100 the numerator can be also written as the measurement uncertainty the measurement uncertainty is half the resolution or precision of the instrument for single readings uh, that's an important distinction to be made single reading instruments are ohm meters voltmeters ammeters uh, thermometers when measuring the exact temperature uh, some double in, uh, double reading instruments are meter rule weigh ba weighing balance it's called a double balance uh, no, sorry double reading instruments because when we are using a ruler a meter rule and we measure the length of something we have to measure this value and this value so we are actually measuring two values over here in this case it's an ohmmeter it only it's a single reading instrument in this case the precision is 0 0.001 divided by 2 and the measured value is 0 0.289 we multiply 100 with this we get the answer of 0 0.17 percent now for part B, we are told that the thickness of the graphite pencil shading can be determined from the resistivity of graphite which is a known value. We have to describe how we could find an accurate value for the thickness. And we are told that we have to use a suitable graph over here. Uh, we know that the formula for resistance, the formula of resistance using resistivity is rho l by a where rho is the resistivity l is the length of the conductor and a is the surface a cross sectional area the length is this length over here this is l the cross sectional uh, area would be since this is a shading on a horizontal uh, piece of paper it will be a rectangle over here this cross section for that rectangle one side will be the width of this and the other side will be the thickness of the shading this is the width and this is the thickness we have to imagine this in 3d so it's coming out of the paper and into the, and going into the paper for you uh, this is the thickness the area is the width into the thickness Uh, we can find out the width and the length using a meter rule over here or we can just use uh, the fact that it's done on a graph paper we know how much one box is in length and we can just figure it out so we talk about how we measure the length and the width over here we know that uh, the 
thickness of the shading was uniform so the value of t is same throughout the whole thing and if we look at this the value of w is also unchanged throughout so the value of w throughout the whole shading is unchanged one uh, so we what we can do is plot a graph of the resistance we know that the resistivity and the area is constant the area is constant because we know that w and t remain the same so we can write this as in this form this over here is a constant so we can compare it to the graph of a straight line the value of c is 0 over here so this will be a straight line through origin we can change the value of the length so we can move the electrodes apart we can move these electrodes further apart so I can put the electrode over here for instance and if I do that the length will change and hence we can plot a graph of resistance against the length. So we'll measure the resistance R at different values of length and then plot a graph of R against length. This graph will be a straight line through origin and its gradient will be its resistivity divided by its cross sectional area. So its gradient is equal to its resistivity, the resistivity of uh, graphite divided by W into T where T is the thickness. So width into thickness. From here I can find uh, the thickness which will be the resistivity divided by the width multiplied by the gradient now we have to identify a possible source of systematic error in our model this might be due to a zero error in the uh, ohmmeter this thing over here when the resistance is zero this reading might not be zero in this ohmmeter over here or it could be due to the resistance in the contact between the electrode and the shading it could be either one of them the more the most common systematic error we will uh, approach will be zero error in this case so we talk about the zero error on the ohmmeter if i use the vernier caliper in this part or so b1 i could have also talked about the zero error when using a vernier caliper So the zero error of the ohm meter is the is a possible source of systematic error in this case. Now moving on to part two or question two. Now we have a investigation about the interference of sound waves. Uh, we used a single single signal generator with two loudspeakers. We are using one signal generator with two loudspeakers. We have to uh, state the reason for this in the first question. This would be because uh, if I connect it to different signal generators, the sound coming from the loudspeaker might not be coherent. If they're from the same signal generator, they must be in phase and will be coherent. Now for part two, we have to identify a health and safety issue. In this case, we are hearing a loud sound so the safety issue is the damage to our ears when we are exposed to loud sound. The uh, solution for this, uh, since we are also asked how to deal with it, we can wear earplugs so that the sound doesn't affect our ears that badly. So in this case, we talk about how a loud sound can cause damage to our ears. And we'll talk about the we'll talk about how we'll deal with this by wearing a earplug. So in this case, we talk about how a loud sound can damage our ears, and we can wear earplugs to deal with it. Moving on to part B of this question, uh, we have to find the separation between the maximums. Since we are given 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, we are given 5 of this. We can just have the total and then divide it 
with 5 to get an average. The total in this case is 3.33 which is this value over here minus 0 0.22 and then we divide it with 5. So W is 3.33 minus 0 0.22 divided by 5 which is 0 0.62 meters. Now for part 2 we are given this equation over here linking the separation W with the wavelength of the sound wave. Here D capital D is the perpendicular distance between the loudspeakers and S is the separation of the loudspeakers. D is the perpendicular distance between the loudspeakers and line AB my bad. This line over here or basically the screen or the line at which we are observing our maximus. So this distance over here is D and this distance over here is S. Uh, we are given these values as well. We have to find the value of lambda. Now if I notice at the units I have to convert this to meters everything else we are given are already in meters. I will convert this by multiplying 10 to the power minus 2 with this. Now I can use the equation I have the value of W which is 0 0.62 from the last question. So 0 0.62 will be equal to the wavelength we are trying to find the wavelength in this question multiplied by D which is 4 meters divided by s which is 110 into 10 to the power minus 2 meters we can rearrange this and make lambda the subject we'll get 0 0.62 multiplied by 110 into 10 to the power minus 2 divided by 4 we get lambda to be 0 0.1705 i'll take 0 0.17 meters only in this case i cannot take zero this this will be too much in unit 3 and 6 we cannot use too many significant figures or uh, too few in these units the amount or the number of significant figures we use uh, will be judged and marked so for most cases uh, it's safe to use 2 or 3 SF only uh, 1 SF is always wrong almost always and it's not safe to go for 4 or 5 as well Five definitely not four at max you can go but it's preferred not to in this case this value over here was given in 2SF it's best to use uh, significant figures according to the one with the least significant figures of the given values so this was one of the given value over here this was in 2SF this was in 3SF this value was also found in uh, 2SF over here. We will always use the lowest value of significant figures in our given data when we are writing our answer. Now for part 3, uh, we are told that the student expected a maximum intensity at the middle or the point equidistant to the loudspeakers. So this point over here. He expected a maximum at this point. However, he didn't get that. So we have to suggest why there was a minimum intensity at this point, not a maximum as expected. Uh, one possible case would be because uh, the signal generators might not have been uh, connected properly. We might have a reverse connection. So instead of connecting the positives together or we don't have to know in detail what happened. But if we reverse the connection, so instead of doing this if I wanted to do this but instead did this over here the waves that will come out will be in antiphase instead of being in phase they are coherent but if the connections are not made properly instead of coming out in phase they will uh, come out in antiphase so at the midpoint there will be destructive interference instead of constructive that we were expecting uh, the fact about uh, the reverse connection we don't even have to write about that that's one possible case in this question so in the answer we talk about how the 
sound waves emitted from the speakers are in antiphase and hence destructive interference occurs in the middle instead of the constructive that we were expecting. Now for part C, we are told that the student used this investigation to determine the speed of sound in air. We have to determine, uh, determine an accurate value for the speed of sound and we have to explain what other apparatus the student would need in this case. Uh, we know that the uh, speed of sound will be f lambda this equation we have to use this we have already figured out lambda so now we have to figure out the frequency now we have to use uh, another apparatus to measure the frequency uh, this could be done with an oscilloscope so we will find this formula v equals to f lambda we are using this where lambda is already known to us we have figured it out in this part now we only have to find the frequency and we can do that using an oscilloscope some other instruments we could have used uh, would be a frequency meter and that's about it on, for, on C2 we are given that on a humid day the speed of sound in air increases and we have to explain how an increase in the speed of sound would affect the value of W. Uh, for waves, the frequency do not change with the speed, the wavelength does. So lambda changes with speed while the frequency stays constant. Uh, the frequency for a wave is a constant. It's the defining uh, feature of a wave. So what makes red light red is its frequency. Its frequency is set. It's constant. The wavelength can change depending on the medium it's traveling through. But its frequency is the same. The same case applies for sound waves as well. And we know that uh, V equals to F lambda. We can make lambda the subject over here. The frequency is constant and the speed of sound is increasing so lambda must increase from the previous part we also know that w equals to lambda d by s w equals to lambda d divided by s d by s is remaining constant lambda is increasing so w will increase so the value of w will increase in this question so this is how we structure our answer we talk about how lambda is equal to v divided by f and if v increases lambda will increase while f is unchanged and we also know that w is equals to lambda d by s and in this case w will increase with the increase in lambda because d and s are unchanged now moving on to question three we are given an investigation of the stretching of a spring where the student used a meter rule to find the unstretched length which was given 5.2 centimeter we have to explain why this meter rule is an appropriate instrument for this case i have to find the percentage uncertainty and show that it's a very small value so if i do that the percentage uncertainty for a meter rule uh, we discussed this earlier it's a double reading instrument so its uncertainty is 0.05 and we multiply 2 with it this will be divided by the measured value which is 5.2 and we multiply the whole thing with 100 to convert this into percentage we get a value of 1.9 so around 2 percent the percentage uncertainty is only around 2 percent so this is an appropriate instrument in this case so we talk about how a percentage uncertainty of 2% is small. So if the uncertainty is small, the uh, instrument is appropriate to use. Now we are uh, told about, we described the experiment over here. We are uh, told that the student added a load to the spring and measured the stretch length L as shown over here. We have to describe two techniques that the student should use to make the measurements as accurate as possible so when taking the reading of L 
one of them would be to take the reading from eye level if i don't do that there will be parallax error and another thing would be to ensure that this meter rule is vertically placed using a set square so the first point is about how it's viewed from eye level or at right angle the more appropriate uh, answer is to talk about how the this line over here is perpendicular to this meter rule at the back so this must be 90 degree the line of your sight this line over here and the scale uh, another relevant point would be keeping the meter rule close to the spring and load if i keep the meter rule far away there will be more uncertainty and unreliability added into our readings now we are given part b we are given the weight and the length of the spring we have to criticize the readings We'll just talk about uh, the inconsistent significant figures used in the length since we are only given one mark here. Uh, the inconsistent number of significant figures are used in both W and L. I missed this just a while ago. So in this case we are only given one decimal place or one SF. Here we are given two significant figures. In the case of length we have three significant figure here. 2 over here, 2 over here, 3 over here, 3 over here. So this is one of the criticizing points. Now in part 2 we are told that the student plotted the graph shown opposite. We have to explain which value he should check. So this graph is what he has plotted. Uh, we have to find, uh, we have to state what value the student should check over here. So. We are basic, they are basically asking us what value he should double check or in this case we have to find the anomalous reading which is this one over here. This is the value at uh, w equals to 0 0.39 and x l equals to 12. So 0.3912 this point over here this should be checked again. And this value should be checked because all the other points are very close to the line of best fit while this is far away. Look, it seems to be an anomalous reading. This is how we write our answer. We talk about how the value at 12, 0 0.39, 12 is the value in the x-axis and 0.39 in the y-axis or w. At this value, this should be checked as this is the, this is the point which is farthest from the line of best fit. The other points are very close to the line of best fit over here. In part 3 we are given that the value of L for this spring when a modeling clay is uh, hung from it is 8.4 centimeters. We have to determine the weight of this. So we can use our graph over here. 8.4 will be over here. We have to find this value. This will be 0 0.23. If I want to figure out this value, in the x-axis we have 5 boxes per 1 unit. So each box is 0.2 units or in this case it is 0.2 cm. So this is 8.2 and this value is 8.4 cm. Now if I go on to the x-axis, each uh, 10 box or sorry each 5 box is uh, 0.1 units so one box is 0 0.02 units so this over here is 0 0.22 this over here is 0 0.24 this black line comes and meets at midway through both of them so this is 0 0.23 so the weight is 0.23 newtons now in part c we are told that the student added more modeling clay to the spring and determined the weight w1 and then he submerged the clay in a beaker of water and determined the new force on the spring we are given this formula over here where the density of modeling clay divided by density of water is w1 divided by w1 minus f 
In this question, we have to determine the density of the modeling. So the density of the modeling clay is the unknown over here. We can consider this to be D. So D divided by 1000 will be equal to W1 which is 0.65 divided by W1 minus F. So W0.65 minus 0.27. D will be 0.65 divided by 0.38 multiplied by a thousand if we calculate that we get a value of 1710 so D is 1710 kg per meter cube this is the density of the modeling clay now for part 3 we have uh, we are told that the student estimated the percentage uncertainty be uh, percentage uncertainty to be four percent and the density of the polymer clay is 1760 meter cube we have to determine whether this can be made of the polymer clay now for questions like this every type of question of this type where we are given a value and we have to find whether it can be another thing over here so this is our experimental value 1710 and this is a data book value where we are asked if the modeling clay can be polymer clay so one of the methods uh, is the percentage difference method the other method is the range method You could use either one of them or use only one of them de uh, depending on which one is more convenient to you. So the percentage D over here means the percentage difference. In this question the percentage difference uh, method would be easier. In some other questions the range method will be significantly easier. So if you know how to use both of these methods. Uh, it would be a very uh, useful tool but to save your time in the exams in this question we are already given the percentage uncertainty so percentage uncertainty in this case is four percent now in this first method or the percentage difference method i have to find the percentage difference so the percentage difference is the difference between our value and the data book value in this case 1760 our value was 1710 and we'll divide it now the denominator depends on the question if we are given a data book value like in this case we'll use the data book value as the denominator for sure however if we are given another value which is not a data book value or so basically if I find this value over here and then we are told that another student ran an experiment and got this value then we'll take the average of them so if I was told this was done by another student I will uh, take the average of our values and then calculate the percentage difference since this is a data book value we'll use this as the denominator and we'll find the percentage difference which is this percentage difference is 2.8 percent now if the percentage uncertainty is greater than the percentage difference uh, we can say that the polymer uh, the modeling clay was polymer clay so we can make a positive statement if the percentage difference is less than the or greater than the percentage sorry the percentage uncertainty is greater than the percentage difference and if it's the other case so when the percentage uncertainty is less than the percentage difference we cannot support the statement so this is vice versa we cannot support the statement in this case the percentage uncertainty was greater so we can support the statement uh, we can tell that uh, the modeling clay was 
the modeling clay could have been uh, polymer clay this is the percentage difference method now for the range method uh, we have our value of 1710 to this we'll add 4% of 1710 4 by 100 into 1710 by this we get the maximum value of the density so d max is 1710 plus 4 by 100 into 1710 this is the maximum density 1780 and the minimum will be 1710 minus the same thing so plus minus if i do that i get a value of 1640 kg per meter cube if the value lies within this range so between these two values we can support the statement so from this question we uh, get the same uh, conclusion that the modeling clay could be polymer clay now for question 4 we are investigating the motion of a toy car along a horizontal track using this apparatus we are told that the launching device applies a force on the car causing it to accelerate and the mean value of the applied force during each launch is f now we are given in the first question the time it takes for the toy car from go from marker 1 to marker 2 i uh, have we have to find the mean value of the time in seconds the mean value over here will be 3.57 plus 3.61 simply adding all of them plus 3.54 plus 3.51 divided by how many of them they are if i had a value that was significantly different so a value like 3.80 i'll not consider it i'll just think of it as it doesn't even exist in this case none of the values are significantly different from each other so there are no anomalies over here if i calculate this i get 3.5575 since all of the values are given in three decimal place uh, sorry two three significant figures or two decimal places i'll do the same with the mean value which will be 3.56 seconds now we have to find the percentage uncertainty in this if we have multiple readings the percentage uncertainty is the max value minus the minimum value divided by 2 divided by the average and then we multiply it with 100 as usual so for this case over here the maximum value of the time was 3.61 the minimum was 3.51 so we have 3.61 minus 3.51 divided by 2 divided by 3.56 which is our average and multiply it with 100 if we do that we get a value 1.4 percent this is the percentage uncertainty for this question now for part b we're told that the launching device is adjusted to vary the mean force applied to the car and then we are told that for larger values of the force there were a greater percentage uncertainty in the measurement of time we have to disk we are told this because if the force was bigger the car's velocity will be bigger so the time it takes to cover the same distance will be smaller and if i measure so if the measured value is smaller the percentage uncertainty will be bigger we are asked how we could use a different apparatus over here to measure the time so that the percentage uncertainty is reduced over here we use the stopwatch 
we can use light gates instead if i use light gates the measurement uncertainty will decrease we can take finer readings over here so the percentage uncertainty will be reduced by reducing the percentage uncertainty and since this is a describe question we don't have to explain the reasoning behind our choice we just have to describe how we'll set up a light gate and connect them to a data logger or a computer to find the time and use a data logger to find the time or measure the time or determine the time now for part c we're given that for each launch the launching device applied the force for a constant time and for each value of the force the student determined the mean velocity and we got this relation of shape over here where the force multiplied by the time is equal to the mass times the velocity we have to explain why a graph of force against v could be used to determine the time t so if i make f the subject i get m by uh, m by t times v we are already told in this case that the time for each case is a constant value so this is a constant the mass of the car is also constant since we are using the same car so if i increase the force the velocity will increase so if i plot a graph of f against t this can be compared to the graph of y equals to mx plus c or the equation of a straight line so we talk about how this can be compared to the equation of a straight line y equals to mx plus c here c is zero so the graph of force against uh, velocity will be a straight line through origin with its gradient being the mass divided by the time we already know the mass of the toy car we can just measure it using a weighing balance and then i can find the time directly and using this fact over here that the gradient is equal to the mass divided by the time i can make t the subject will get mass by the gradient we don't have to go that far this is enough to secure the two marks now in part two we have to uh, plot a graph of f on the y axis and v on the x axis the values of f and v are given over here and our graph paper is given over here the values on the y axis ranges from 0.5 to 4.5 i want to plot my graph from 5 to 0 so i'll have 5 minus 0 divided by i want to use most of the grid so in the y axis i have 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 and 12 boxes so i divide it by 12 i get 5 by 12 is 0 0.42 0 0.42 is not an easy value to work with so i'll take the value bigger than this which is easy to work with this will be 0 0.5 the values that are easy to work with is 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 1, 2, 5, 10. Any multiples of uh, 5, 10 or 2 is good. Five and uh, The multiples of 5 and 10 are the easiest to work with. We have 0 0.5 over here. We'll use 0 0.5. We had 0 0.42, but we'll use the value that's bigger than this and easy to use. So I'll start from 0 and each uh, large box or each 10 small boxes, I'll take uh, 0.5. This is 1.0, 1 1.5, 2.0, 3.0, 4.0, 5.0.
3.5 I'll go on until I get a 4.0 over here I don't have to go much further I'll just go up to 4.5 now for the x-axis oh I have to go for 4.5 now for the x-axis I we have values from 0 0.28 to 2.52 so I want to take a graph um, from 0 to 2.6 or 2.55 so 2.55 minus 0. Point, oh sorry 0 divided by the number of boxes in the x-axis now we have 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 boxes in the x-axis so we divided this by 8 we get a value of 0 0.318 or 0 0.32 so we'll take 0 0.5 in the x-axis as well so 0 0 0 0.5 1.0 1.5 2.0 2.5 3.0 3.5 take one more over here since i wanted to go up to 5 in this case now the first pair of point is 0 0.5, 0 0.28 or 0 0.28, 0 0.5. Now each uh, 10 boxes in the x-axis represents 0 0.5. So each small box represents 0 0.05. So this box is 0 0.05. This one is 0 0.10. This one is 0 0.15 and we go on now in the x-axis each 10 boxes is 0.5 units as well so it's the same over here so 0.5 by 10 which is 0 0.05 now our first uh, value is 0 0.5 on the y-axis so on this line and 0 0.28 on the x-axis so this is 0 0.05 one zero one five two zero two five three zero so it's somewhere over here so this is our first point now the next pair of readings is at 1.5 in the y-axis and 0 0.84 in the x-axis so this is 0.55 Six zero six five seven zero seven five eight zero eight five. So somewhere really close to this line, and its uh, y value is one point five. So up there, over here, yeah. So over here. Our next value is at 2.5F and 1.40L. Oh, we have to label our axis as well. We'll do that now so that we don't miss it out later. We have the force in newtons over here and the velocity in meters per second over here. So the third pair of reading is that f equals to 2.5 and v equals to 1.40 i wrote l accidentally while while ago 1.40 is over here and 2.5 is over here so this is our point the next pair is at 3.5 1.97 3.5 is this line over here 1.97 is between this so somewhere over here and finally the last pair of values is at uh, 4.5 and 2.52 2.52 will be over on 
this line 4.5 is here so that's where our value is now we can just draw a line of best fit through this point we get this and now for the next part we have to determine the gradient of our graph and then find the value of t using that the gradient for our case we'll take two points on the graph i'll take if i continue this i'll just take from what we had i'll take this point over here this is 4.45 and its uh, x value is 2.5 so this point is 2.5 comma 4.45 and the other point i'll just consider the origin 0 comma 0 from that uh, this is x2 y2 this is x1 y1 the gradient is y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1 for our case y to 4.45 x to is 2.5 so 4.45 divided by 2.5 and we have minus 0 for both cases the gradient comes out to be 1.78 and we know that the gradient is equals to the mass divided by the time the time will be the mass divided by 1.78 the mass is 0 0.125 i divide 1.78 t will come out to be 0 0.0.07 0 .07 seconds we'll have the time over here 0 0.07 and that's it for this paper.